It's always great to see Burgess Meredith in a Twilight Zone episode. Mr. Dingle the Strong was only his second appearance, and it's packed with other recognizable talent too, both on camera and behind it. This was another one of Rod Serling's more comedic scripts, which rarely worked well. However, there are several notable qualities about this one that are worth delving into. Luther Dingle is a wormy vacuum cleaner salesman who's routinely picked on by fellow bar patrons and children alike. Observing him is an invisible two-headed Martian looking to conduct an experiment on an Earthling, and they consider Dingle to be the ideal candidate. Weak, cowardly, and subphysical. They imbue him with 300 times the average human strength, and very quickly, Dingle starts to realize what he can do. He starts performing feats of strength in public and gains the attention of the whole town. Eventually, Luther returns to the bar to be interviewed for a TV special where he draws an excited crowd. First thing I want to bring up is the name Dingle. There are two different accounts of where Rod got it from. In Mark Zickrey's The Twilight Zone Companion book, Zickrey states that it came from a reporter who mistakenly called the Al Denton character from Mr. Denton on Doomsday, Dingle. Rod liked this name and used it appropriately for this kind of character. In a commentary track on the Blu-ray set, Martin Grahams Jr., author of The Twilight Zone Unlocking the Door to a Television Classic, has a different story. He says Serling wanted to originally name the Al Denton character Al Dingle after a friend of his, but changed it during production. He then got another chance to use the name in this episode. It's not really a consequential factoid, but it is funny that there are disparate accounts of where a name like Dingle came from. John Brom was back to direct his first season 2 episode. It's the second and final time he worked with Burgess Meredith on the show, and since he's possibly the most well-known director from the original series, it's surprising that they were both stuck with this one. Critics at the time didn't like it much, and I can't say I disagree with them. It's not really the fault of anyone involved in the production of the episode itself. I'd say the issues lie in the script and the thin main idea. Yes, it's cool to see these two-headed aliens and the in-camera strength effects that were pulled off, but there was nothing challenging or overly interesting about the story. When you bring in Burgess and Brom, especially after the mega-success of Time Enough at Last, one would expect them to not be saddled with an episode aimed to humor the audience instead of making them think. It just felt like wasted potential considering the talent involved. Don't get me wrong, Meredith is doing his best, but without a real point, everything that happens just feels a bit empty. Fortunately, both Brom and Burgess went on to be involved in much better episodes. As I mentioned earlier, Mr. Dingle the Strong had a solid cast. Don Rickles took his one and only trip into the Twilight Zone here, and it's nice to see him in something like this circa 1961. He has what's billed as a commentary track on the Blu-ray set, but it's actually just him talking for about three minutes. Guess he got tired of watching the episode pretty quick. James Milholland also shows up in a small part after appearing in season one's The After Hours. Quick shout out to James Westerfield, who plays the bartender, Anthony O'Toole. He's in one of my favorite movies of all time, On the Waterfront, so it was a pleasant surprise to recognize him on my latest rewatch. The Two-Headed Martian was played by Michael Fox, no, not that one, and Douglas Spencer. This was actually Spencer's last credit. He passed away five months before the episode aired. The Martian costume slash makeup definitely feels like classic Twilight Zone. I really like how they look with all the bells and whistles attached. The strength effects were also decently well done for the time. My favorite shot is when Dingle picks up the Don Rickles character, but they make no attempt to hide Burgess's stunt double. Rickles has a stuntman in a bald cap take his place for that shot too, but it's a little less obvious. Producer Buck Houghton mentioned that the strength effects forced Mr. Dingle the Strong to go $1,800 over budget. There's at least one aspect that's pretty fun about the episode. Seeing that Dingle has wasted his gift on petty exhibition, the Martians take away his powers. On their way out, they run into aliens from Venus, also invisible, who are looking to conduct intelligence experiments. The Martians suggest Dingle, and the Venusians proceed to make him 500 times smarter than the average human. Luther impresses the remaining bar patrons with his newfound mental capacity as the story wraps up. So the pair of nine-year-olds who play the Venusians are just perfectly weird. How they shimmy off when they walk is hilarious. They also dub in adult voices to make them sound even better. Sudden introduction of extreme intelligence. Find any interesting subjects? 
Prior to airing, they appeared in a 1960 edition of Life magazine to promote the show. These two kids are probably the best part of the episode. Unfortunately, that's not saying much. This is definitely a subpar installment of the series, and it's a shame they sort of wasted one of Meredith's four appearances. But he is able to rebound in spectacular fashion with his next. Serling later adapted this story in written form for a book release with other expanded episodes. He changed a few things here and there, but as for the version that hit the small screen in 1961, Mr. Dingle the Strong falls far from a recommendation. But if you want something goofy with a good cast and very odd sci-fi elements sprinkled in, you could get a kick out of it. Just don't kick too hard. Like Mr. Dingle, you might boot yourself right into the Twilight Zone.